Hey everyone, today we're talking about reflux and indigestion. As you know, we've been focused on the topic of gastrointestinal conditions uh, as we're uh, trying to get more people um, about our new online program called uh, uh, The Gut Puzzle, um, where we talk about a step-by-step -step approach to really how to go through and, and, and improve your own gastrointestinal system with that, with dietary protocols and assessment forms and questionnaires and all the things that um, are really important to uh, be able to figure out what to do. Now, today's topic is on uh, reflex and indigestion, and, and there's a few things you really need to know about this and uh, some clinical considerations that are really important. First of all, when you're looking at uh, reflux and indigestion, you got to realize that um, if it's an ongoing thing where you're having symptoms all the time of reflux and indigestion, that's a really red flag that there's things going on. So one of the things that we do know is that, um, that the gastrointestinal tract and the microbiome have been getting a lot of attention in, in research studies and how they impact overall health. There's even a new paper that just got published where they showed that um, uh, individuals that end up with severe uh, COVID um, reactions and adverse effects have different microbiomes than those that do not. And one of the key things is just the health of their microbiome and so forth. So one of the things to take into account is is really um, you know how our health is impacted when our health when our GI tract and microbiome is is not healthy. So one of the factors could be related to how we deal with infections. Other issues, lots of research been published with the health of the microbiome being different in patients that have chronic depression versus patients that don't, and change the microbiome can actually change symptoms of depression. Everything from energy to mood to cardiovascular disease to neurodegeneration to our general immune system is really based upon how healthy your gastrointestinal system is. So it's a red flag if a person constantly has indigestion um, and reflux symptoms. And simply you know, trying to hide the symptoms of reflux with an antacid uh, doesn't fix the gut. It's really a red flag that something's going on. It's a major issue. And then having chronic indigestion and just expecting to have indigestion when you eat certain meals is, all, is also a red flag that you have some things that are impacting your gastrointestinal tract. So what we want to do is we want to kind of discuss what do what these things really mean and what are the far-reaching effects. So first of all, if you have Tums, if you have antacids, if you're using those regularly, you've got a gastrointestinal imbalance. It's just that simple. And you have to realize that if you have constant reflux and constant indigestion, there's something wrong with your gut, which means that your overall health can now be less efficient than, than it needs to be. And this will lead to far-reaching effects over a period of time. So you have to have a healthy gut to prevent disease and to stay healthy and to have ideal immune function and healthy mood and healthy energy levels. So um, now all of us can get some indigestion here or there if we drastically change our diet, if we get exposed to certain pathogens. But if it's a regular thing, if it's a common thing, then there's a problem. So the first thing to really think about is just if you have indigestion and reflux, um, does it happen all the time? Or is there specific meals that can cause it? If some people will know, like, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna have, let's say, Italian food, so I need to bring Tums with me because I know if I have Italian food, I'm gonna have this reaction. That's not a good idea. That's actually telling you that there's something that, that's involved. So if you can predict a food that's gonna cause an ingestion, you really wanna look at, is, your, is that meal really high in protein? If it's a protein issue, then that's a hydrochloric acid issue. Is that food really high in carbohydrates and starch? Uh, that could be a pancreatic enzyme issue, or is it really due to that meal being really high in fat? Um, so those are the first things, and that could be more of a gallbladder issue. And these are things we talk about in the gut health solving the puzzle program we have. Again, if you haven't uh, checked that program out, please go to drknews, drknews.com, and we're launching that program uh, just in a few days. Now, when you're looking at the most common symptom, is reflux. So a lot of people have reflux. Actually, antacids are some of the top prescribed medications um, in the world. And what reflux is letting us know is that there's a person that's having a difficulty with their balance of hydrochloric acid release, that they're not releasing digestive enzymes, hydrochloric acid being the main enzyme that's released in the stomach to digest proteins. And hydrochloric acid is really critical because it also allows for the gastrointestinal tract to change its pH. It's very acidic, so it can neutralize pathogens. It can create a sterile environment for the gut all the way down to the small intestine, even the large intestine. It can impact things like microbiome diversity. 
Now, what happens when people don't have enough proper hydrochloric acid release in their stomach is that, first of all, um, they may just have a hard time digesting protein. They just feel like they have a brick in their stomach after they eat. They just feel like it just food stays in their stomach for a long period of time. And uh, that's one part of it. Another part of it is for other people tend to have like burning acid reflux symptoms. Um, and um, they'll have to take something like an anti-acid to get rid of those symptoms. That also happens actually when you have low hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid helps digest proteins and foods and changes the pH of the stomach, but it also, um, if it's not being released properly uh, and you give yourself a really high load of carbohydrates or protein, you may have an adverse reaction response where you pump out way too much HCL than you need to because your um, physiology and your gut is abnormal. Also, if proteins can't be broken down effectively, they actually putrefy and create microorganisms that are even more acidic than HCL and that causes some burning and reflux and some irritation in the stomach lining. So. Paradoxically, which seems kind of strange, when people actually have symptoms of burning and reflux, it's usually a sign that they actually don't have enough hydrochloric acid. And for people, so that's one group, and then the other group is um, people that just feel like they just can't digest protein. So typically when people have a low hydrochloric acid, it's in uh, this really one of two groups. Those that just don't feel like they can digest protein well, have brick in their stomach, and then those that get a burn of, symptoms of burning and reflux, especially when they eat high foods, very high in carbs, very high in protein, and they just have a hard time digesting those. So those reflux symptoms are a red flag. That means your body may not be producing enough hydrochloric acid. And if it's not producing enough hydrochloric acid, you may have some real long-term health issues. One of the key things is you have to have proper release of hydrochloric acid to absorb minerals, especially calcium. So you get, you get calcium malabsorption issues because you need to have that acidity to absorb calcium and also other essential minerals. Iron deficiencies start to happen when you don't produce enough hydrochloric acid. B12 deficiencies are really common to happen when you start to have hydrochloric acid deficiencies. And if you have a hydrochloric acid deficiency, even if you take a multivitamin or a B12 supplement, you're not going to absorb it because you need to have that acidity of the stomach in order for that absorption process to take place. So one of the things, you, you know, it's kind of in summary, so if you have reflux symptoms all the time, or if a person you know has reflux symptoms all the time, it's a very strong indication they may not have enough hydrochloric acid, and in the long term, they're gonna, that's gonna lead to um, vitamin um, deficiency, uh, well, it's gonna lead to uh, mineral and calcium deficiencies, B12 deficiencies, and iron deficiencies. Those, those nutrients are totally dependent upon hydrochloric acid for ideal absorption. And then those can lead to far-reaching effects downstream. Lots of studies on B12 deficiencies, increasing things like um, uh, dementia, uh, mood disorders, depression, uh, high homocysteine patterns associated with cardiovascular disease, calcium, especially in your early years, um, really important for improving your bone densities. Uh, so you have healthy bone densities, you get older. Um, and then other essential minerals, everything from muscle cramping to um, overall general health can be impacted. So it's a red flag when you have ongoing heartburn and so forth. Also, if you don't have enough hydrochloric acid and when you eat, you get this paradoxical burning type symptom from, from various factors, um, you also are prone to getting infections. The most common one being H. pylori infections um, and other pathogens. So your first line of defense against any type of ingestion, any pathogen is to have an, uh, the acidity of your stomach by releasing hydrochloric acid to neutralize that. So those are things that also happen when people have um, these reflux symptoms. So the bottom line is, is reflux is a serious red flag that your digestion is off. If you don't address it, you may have ongoing um, mineral and vitamin deficiencies that take place. Uh, you may not be able to break down your proteins very well over a period of time. Those can also start to promote what's called loss of tolerance. So you start to react to more food proteins, so you get more food sensitivities. And uh, you also, uh, from a north to south, start to throw off your ability to diversify your gut, and it leads to a whole host of health problems. So something so simple as reflux and digestion could be a really serious red flag when you look at the big picture of a person's overall health. So one of the things that you want to do is, is, is to correct that. Now, remember, taking antacid or Tums is just going to alkalinize the stomach, get rid of symptoms, but it's not going to fix the underlying issue and which, first of all, to optimize your gut health and the big picture of things is to actually get your acidity up. 
Now, there are some people that have ongoing um, chronic reflux symptoms that actually end up with an ulcer, and there's some people that have some reflux symptoms and don't end up with an with the actual gastric lining uh, injury called the gastric ulcer or duodenal ulcer. So you gotta figure out which group you're in. So if you have heartburn um, and reflux, one of the ways to kind of distinguish where you're at with a lot of, without a, doing advanced imaging and studies is just to see how you respond to apple cider vinegar. So we call this an apple cider vinegar challenge. So if you notice heartburn, next time you get reflux, you wanna take two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, you can just you know, just take the tablespoons and drink the apple cider vinegar. If that's too sour for you, you can mix it with some water and drink it, but you need at least two tablespoons. And then you want to see what happens to your reflux symptoms. And, and um, if you notice that your reflux symptoms surprisingly go away when you take something like apple cider vinegar, that strongly indicates that your reflux symptoms are really due to lack of hydrochloric acid, that you actually need more acidity to get rid of your symptoms. And in those cases, you definitely want to uh, either either use apple cider vinegar with each of your meals to help digest your food or start taking hydrochloric acid digestive supplements. Now we go through all this in the gut puzzle program but I just want to share with you the the essential concepts that hopefully if you're just listening you can you can incorporate into your to your lifestyle now and, and see some improvements in your health. If on the other hand you take the apple cider vinegar and your reflux symptoms get much 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 worse that's a sign that you may actually have irritation or a pre-ulcer or actual gastric ulcer, that the extra acidity actually irritated the, your stomach lining. And in those cases, it um, you may need to heal your stomach lining first. So if you actually have a gastric ulcer um, and you have significant reflux uh, symptoms that made worse by taking apple cider vinegar, you probably want to go see your physician. You probably want to make sure you don't have an H. pylori infection. It's a bacterial infection that causes ulcers. And then at the same time, um, you gotta be careful because the, the conventional approach is to give you more ant, more antacids, but sometimes you need an antibiotic protocol to get rid of it, uh, to get rid of the H. pylori infection. Other times it's just, you just have a gastric ulcer and you may just wanna try to heal it. Now, deglycerized licorice that you can buy at the health food store, DGL, deglycerized licorice, um, is a very effective uh, compound that's been shown in numerous studies to help heal uh, the uh, gastric ulcers. Um, and it also has very powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects, um, very known, very little uh, side effects at all, if any, for most people. And uh, DGL can be something that can be used to heal the stomach lining. And then if you take DGL for a period of time, you can introduce apple cider vinegar in maybe two to three weeks later and see if you can tolerate it. And if you took some deglycerized licorice and then you can handle apple cider vinegar, you're on your way to fixing your chronic reflux maybe you've had for five, 10 years. And then at that point, you can then maybe even step up uh, to taking actual hydrochloric acid supplements for a period of time. And sometimes people just need a little bit of stomach acid to really improve their gut and so forth. Um, so those are, those are the key things that you really wanna understand about hydrochloric acid issues. Now, if you have ongoing um, so the next question is like, fine, you establish, you have heartburn, you establish, um, you do the apple cider vinegar challenge, you figure out whether you have an ulcer or if you just need digestive enzymes. Then the next question is, why do you have low hydrochloric acid issues? And this is, this is really important too. And this is like going deeper. So at the surface level, you first want to just get rid of your reflux. And then at the deeper level, you want to ask yourself why, right? So actually, if we, if we, if you make it even, if we make even a better analysis here, it's you first want to look at reflux, then you want to do the apple cider vinegar challenge, um, two tablespoons again. To, uh, with your, you can take the two eight tablespoons directly before you eat with your meal or directly after. And I say directly within the first, you know, five minutes, two to five minutes. Now you take the apple cider vinegar challenge. You see if you have an ulcer. You see if you don't have an ulcer. And then the next question is why do you have? And if you respond one way or the other you gotta ask yourself, why do you have low hydrochloric acid? Well, the number one reason for most people is just because of age. As we get older, we just don't make enough hydrochloric acid. So if you're starting to get to age 50, age 60, you just may not make as much digestive enzymes, just like you just may not recover as much from a workout <laughs> or various other things. You know, your hearing goes down over a period of time, or maybe your vision goes down every time. You're, you know, we all have some type of reserve <laughs> of, of cells 
and they start to become less efficient over time. So one of the things that becomes less efficient over time is just our ability to make digestive enzymes. So as you you know get older than age 40, and especially as you go into 50 and older, you're going to have some some loss of parietal cell function, meaning you just may not make as much enzymes as you used to. In those cases, just supplementing with a digestive enzyme or taking apple cider vinegar with each meal can really help optimize your GI tract. Now, if you're young and you're like below 40, you're in your 20s or 30s and you have heartburn, that's a serious red flag because that's not due to aging. And the most common cause of that would be actually an H. pylori bacterial infection of the gut. And these H. pylori bacterial infections can last for, for decades, for years. So you want to make sure that that's being tested with someone who has any type of um, hypochlorhydria type symptoms. Now, conditions like hypothyroidism can cause inability to produce hydrochloric acid, um, brain to gut access disorders, uh, things like traumatic brain injuries that disrupt that pathway can, can impact hydrochloric acid uh, dysfunction. Um, just having chronic inflammation in the gut, like having an ongoing gluten sensitivity and you continue to eat gluten or milk or gluten dairy sensitivity and continue to eat those things can cause you to have chronic need to neutralize your stomach and change your pH where hydrochloric acid can be important. So then, so those are things you have to think about, but that's the reflux story, okay? Now, another major, and that's one of the most common gastrointestinal disorders, and here's the thing, you have people that have like reflux symptoms for 10, 15 years. That 10 to 15 years of having reflux symptoms is going to have far-reaching effects on your health. You may be calcium deficient for 10 to 15 years because you don't have enough acidity to absorb it. You may end up with significant changes in your microbiome, which can increase your inflammatory states and promote all types of diseases over a period of time. So it's, it's a big deal. You know, so it's not reflux is not just some trivial thing. If you have reflux all the time, it's a red flag that your gastrointestinal tract is unhealthy. Now, we also wanted to talk today about gallbladder sludge because in the previous talks we talked a lot about the gallbladder and people are always you know, asking if we can do a talk on the gallbladder, so let's talk about that. Now, one of the key things to remember is that you can end up with gallbladder problems um, and it's more common in females as you age. Now, the main risk factors for having um, and when we say gall, gallbladder problems, this is what we're referring to. We're not referring to gallstone obstruction. Gallstone obstruction is pretty rare. Gallstone problems means that in thin your gallbladder, which is a little sac next to your liver, your liver makes something called bile, and the gallbladder contracts and releases bile, and then bile helps digest fats. And then the bile also has things called bile salts, which are there to digest fats, but bile salts also bind to receptors in the gut called FXR receptors and TGR receptors, and it modulates how your gastrointestinal system functions. So the release of bile does two things. It helps break down fats, and it also helps that helps activate and improve your gastrointestinal function by activating receptors through bile salts. So it's really important to have a healthy gallbladder. So when we say we have a gallbladder problem, what happens is that this bile starts to get thick, and when it first starts to um, get thick, it forms into what's called gallbladder sludge. And the way this is identified is with an abdominal ultrasound. Someone will do an abdominal ultrasound and they will see the actual sludge formation in the gall, in the gallbladder. And they'll write a report saying this patient exhibits gallbladder sludge. Now, from there, it can then go into gall stone formation. If the gallbladder sludge continues to be um, thickened and thickened, it'll eventually form stones, and those will be gallstones. And then at some time, for some people, those gallstones can cause obstruction. Now, people that have gallbladder problems, when they walk into the healthcare system, they really don't do anything for it unless you get a gallstone obstruction. The gallbladder sludge, they don't really care about it, they don't really think it has any impact on health, and there's no real treatment for the gallbladder unless you get severe uh, gastrointestinal pain and distension and bloating, and then they'll just remove the gallbladder, or if you have a gallbladder obstruction, they'll remove the gallbladder. But outside of that, there's the majority, there's a majority. There's millions and millions of people that have gallbladder sludge that are having significant maldigestion, malabsorption issues that get totally overlooked in the conventional healthcare model. Now, risk factors for having um, um, prone to being gallbladder, what the research has shown, is first of all, if you're a female, you have much higher risk than a male. Just being over age 40 is another risk factor. So as we get older um, is another major risk factor. 
uh, Native American, uh, Mexican American, um, root, you know, um, are more prone to gallstones. Just being overweight or obese, having any kind of insulin resistance, prediabetes, puts you at risk for gallstones. If you're constantly on yo-yo diets where you have to, like, you lose a lot of weight really quickly, that's been shown to be something that f helps promote gallbladder sludge. Lack of physical activity helps form gallbladder sludge. Uh, research has shown just going through the process of pregnancy um, can really increase risk for developing gallstones. It's another risk factor. Diet high in fat, diet low in fiber, um, and then if you take any type of estrogen replacement, whether it's oral contraceptives or natural estrogen replacement therapy, those all increase your risk for developing gallbladder sludge or gallstones and having a gallbladder be inefficient. So um, if you start adding these up, let's say you're over 40, you go on yo-yo diets all the time, you have some pre-diabetes issues, you're sedentary, there you go. You add up enough of those, you start to have your bile turn into sludge. Now when that happens, the most common thing that you'll notice is you can't you really have mild digestion when you specifically when you eat fatty foods. Um, it could be fried foods. It could be foods really high in oils. It could be cheeses. It could be anything that has a lot of fat content in it since your gallbladder can't digest it. And when your gallbladder um, is doesn't have healthy bile because it's all sludged up together in a gallstone to break down your fats, you can get severe bloating and distension and even reflux burping when you eat fats. So if you ever eat foods and you get burping, bloating, and distension, or if you ever take things like fish oil capsules and you immediately start burping up fish oils, that is a major sign that you have some gallbladder maldigestion issues. And we go through diets and everything in the gut puzzle course that we're teaching, but I'm gonna give you some of the key things and mechanisms to understand about it in a second here. But I wanna let you know, first of all, that it's a big deal. So just like pound digestion and reflux is a big deal because it's letting you know you're not producing hydrochloric acid to absorb essential minerals and sterilize your gut and to impact your microbiome diversity. When you have gallbladder sludge formation and inability, inability to, to have healthy bile released, there's gonna be some major problems. First of all, um, you're going to have some problems with vitamin, fat soluble vitamin absorption. So it's gonna be very easy for you to become deficient in vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K. These are essential nutrients for all types of things. Um, there's been an explosion of research on vitamin D in the past uh, 20 years. Um, and even to the point where routine health exams are now checking vitamin D levels with individuals because the research is overwhelming of how it can impact um, various chronic diseases. So, um, if you've ever had your vitamin D levels checked and you've taken vitamin D in it, it's never gone up, you may have a gallbladder issue. And if you have a gallbladder issue, you can take all the vitamin D you want. If you can't absorb it, it's not gonna have any real impact on you. So um, so be aware of that. Now, um, vitamin A, vitamin A is essential for the lungs, it's essential for the heart, it's essential for your epithelium of your nasopharynx, it's essential for your immune system. You can really impact your overall gut barrier, immune barrier, lung barrier health, your general immune cell function when you're vitamin A deficient. Um, vitamin E, really important for your skin, really important for your heart. So you don't want to have anything impair your ideal nutrient intake. So gallbladder problems, being a red flag of having bloating and distension, are a really big deal. Now in addition to developing um, essential fatty acid, I mean, it, Vitamin, fat soluble vitamin insufficiencies like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, you could also develop insufficiencies of what are called essential fatty acids. Essential fatty acids are oils uh, that you get from um, things like nuts and seeds and avocados and fish. And these oils are critical for your brain function, they're critical for your skin, they're critical for your blood vessels. Uh, they're critical for thinning out your clotting factors. Um, so if you have a gallbladder issue, you can be, again, eating, taking flaxseed oil and fish oils and not having all the benefits because you can't absorb them because your body's not releasing bile. You have to release bile in order to break down these, these essential fatty acids and fats and things that contain fat soluble vitamins into absorbable uh, compounds. So when there's a gallbladder issue, it's just beyond getting bloated and distended when you eat fats. It's the fact that you're getting a 
fat, fat soluble vitamin deficiency uh, uh, potential being developed, you may start to have deficiencies in essential fatty acids, which have a whole host of effects down the stream, specifically neurodegeneration and cardiovascular disease. So those are the things that are related to essential fatty acids. Now, just right before we take questions here, let me go over some of the things you can do if you have a gallbladder issue. Now, one of the one of the biggest drivers of gallbladder issues um, is basically the, the the vicious cascade of sedentary lifestyle and high insulin levels. Now, a big clue to you that you may have some um, insulin issues is that when you eat a meal, you get really tired. If you, if you eat a meal and get really fatigued, especially if it's high in carbohydrates and high in sugar, you need to take a nap. That's a sign that you have some degree of insulin resistance and your pancreas is putting out more insulin. And the job of insulin is to carry glucose and starches and sugars that you digest into glucose into your cells. And insulin activates and promotes sludge formation. So sometimes you have to fix a gallbladder issue by really looking at lifestyle. So sedentary lifestyle in combination with just eating and getting tired and fatigued all the time and carving up is going to promote gallbladders. You add that with being over 40 and being on birth control at some point for a period of time in your life, taking estrogen replacement, uh, having multiple kids uh, in your lifespan. It's very easy to have all these risk factors change your physiology where you promote gallstone issues. So lack of sedentary lifestyle, insulin surges, that's, that's a big deal. Now, if you do have gallbladder issues, you really have to go through a process of just going off all fats for a period of time and then taking some nutrients that can thin out the bile. Now, one of the most effective and well-published nutrients that actually thins out bile are flavonoids found in coffee. So coffee actually does thin out bile. Now, assuming you don't have any reason to, to not be able to drink coffee, like for example, if you have hypertension, high blood pressure, you don't want to be drinking coffee. Some people just get too jittery, they can't handle the stimulant of coffee. But if you if you can't tolerate coffee, coffee has been shown to help thin out the bile. And then nutrients like beetroot um, have been shown to be very effective in thinning out the bile. Ginger extract, um, uh, a compound called phosphatidylcholine, uh, the amino acid taurine, uh, the botanical dandelion root, milk thistle, they've all been shown to have some effect in thinning out the bile. So a combination of like beetroot and ginger extract and taurine to phosphatidylcholine can be helpful. A lot of times health food stores have like a product the manufacturer makes just for the gallbladder and usually has many of or many of those things are in there to really give, provide a broad spectrum. But those are the the key things that really involve with, with um, helping out and thinning out the bile. Ginger extract is very effective, very cheap. That's one way to do it. Beetroot extract is uh, also not that ex very cheap. That can be used to help with those pathways. So those are the, the summary of those three things. So as we get into questions here, let me just kind of do a quick summary. So the key concept is if you have indigestion, if you have reflux, it's a red flag Hi. Hi. that you have something really really off that uh, is going to impact your health over a period of time. You're putting yourself at major um, risk if you don't identify the cause and manage it for malnutrition over a period of time which have effects. You can lose the ability to optimize your microbiome diversity. You can impact your sterility of your gut. You can throw off your gut function. And these things then have major impacts on, on various conditions. So anyways, uh, we have a lot of questions. My wonderful wife, Dr. Andrea Reyes is here to help me, Hi. and uh, she helps me figure out <laughs> how to read these questions that go by quickly. So there's a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the a major question is, um, if you don't have a gallbladder, like if it's yes. been removed, then yes. what do you same things? What do you do? Okay. So if you don't have, first of all, if you if you don't have a gallbladder, you had a gall sludge problem probably before. That there's mechanisms that were in play that made you have to have your gallbladder removed. Probably. So you probably had gallstone formation. I mean, with the exception of having a random infection of your gallbladder, if you've had your gallbladder removed, you've had some obstruction or some severe um, um, bloating and distension associated with your gallbladder imbalance. So those mechanisms don't just go away when you get your gallbladder removed. They're still there. So maybe it was a sedentary lifestyle, insulin resistance, some susceptibility of genes, maybe you your body doesn't process estrogens the same way as other people genet genetically, but those factors are all still there. Now, once the gallbladder uh, gets cut out, there's a duct called the cystic duct that um, 
now becomes the new gallbladder and it kind of pushes out and becomes a new gallbladder. So your cystic duct starts to store bile and that makes you more prone to having maldigestion because you just can't store as much, as much bile. So you almost have to treat yourself as you always have, like you still have a gallbladder issue. So you still have to limit your fats. You may need to take digestive enzymes, especially lipase to help you digest your foods. Um, you may need to take things like taurine, phosphatidylcholine, green tea on a regular basis to optimize your digestion and health. But it basically, you know, when you've had your gallbladder removed, the underlying mechanism physiology that thicken your bile are still there. And once your gallbladder is removed, your cystic duct becomes your new gallbladder. And that will also thicken and you still have to treat those underlying symptoms. So for a lot of people that had the gallbladder removed, they get this honeymoon phase where they feel better, the bloating, the stension is gone, their pain is gone, and then within a very short period of time, they still have all these mouth digestion symptoms whenever they eat fats. So you, know, you got to get to the underlying issue with those things. Okay. 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 So Leah's asking, can gallbladder sludge downregulate the HCL production in the stomach? Well, no. The gallbladder sludge can't downregulate the HCL production in the stomach. It actually goes the other way. Because remember, there's a concept that we that we always talk about in the gut, which is north to south. So when you ingest your foods, hydrochloric acid activity, the acidity of those digestive enzymes, um, move from the stomach into the small intestine, and that acidic pH from hydrochloric acid is what causes the gall, gallbladder to to activate and contract. In addition with having fat in the in the small intestine, so um, it's also Many people have gallbladder issues sometimes because their HCL levels are too low and they can't really thin out their bile. They can't get that reflex working. So um, it really works north to south, not south to north. So it's usually HCL that causes gallbladder issues, not the other way around. Okay. And you could have both. And listen, a lot of people have yeah. both. A lot of people have hydrochloric acid deficiency and gallbladder sludge formation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Cynthia is asking, when you suggest going off all fats, does that include liposomal sublingual supplements? Yeah, pretty much. When, so when you're trying to thin out your bile, let's say you do it for a 30 to 60 day window, you really want to go off all fats. And even though your body needs essential fatty acids and fats and oils, you just need to give your gallbladder a break. And uh, it's not a long-term treatment protocol or diet. So you, you're off, let's say, all sources of fats for 30 to 60 days. Maybe you're drinking coffee. Maybe you're taking botanicals and amino acids to help thin out your bile. And then a afterwards, you want to see if you can start to tolerate fat. I'll give you an example um, of what, 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 what I've done in my practice many times. I'll have patients come in and sometimes we'll put them on like a fish oil product or something. And they take a capsule of fish oils and then we get the email, this is really making me burp. I really can't take it. Is there any other option? And it's like, okay, well now we have a fish oil capsule challenge. <laughs> so then we might put the person, take them off all fats for 30 to 60 days and then really um, have them take flavonoids and things to thin their bile, give the gallbladder a break, control their insulin so they're having these constant insulin surges, make sure they're not sedentary. And then at the end of that 30 to 60 days, have them take that one capsule again and see if it still causes burping. And if it doesn't cause burping, then we know their gallbladder is better. If, they're, if they still get burping, then we have them continue with that diet maybe for another 30 days. So sometimes if you know exactly what meal content caused burping for you, you can kind of think of that as a way that you can challenge yourself. And that's how you know how long you need to be off all fats to really fix your gallbladder. Sometimes you can't get your bile salt, your bile thin enough with just diet restriction and things like green tea and taurine and phosphatidylcholine. And you may actually have to use bile salts. And bile salts are available at any health food store over the counter, Amazon. And bile salts, or like ox bile salts, they may be called, uh, you start really slow with them, like one capsule, and then uh, you just take it with each meal. Bile salts activate these FXL receptors in the gut, and they can change motility. So if you take too much, you can get serious um, diarrhea, <laughs> increased bowel movement. So you got to be very careful of, of your dose. Um, and some people can't even tolerate one bile salts. But if you can, if you, if you really need to thin your bile out, and that's that's really the most effective way, you just got to be very careful with the dosage. Okay, next question. Um, so a lot of people have asked, and they're saying, do you have any alternatives to hydrochloric acid or apple cider vinegar? Because they're saying, which you might want to answer, they cannot take either. Right. So if you can't take apple yeah. cider vinegar or hydrochloric acid, most likely do because it causes reflux and burning. Right. That's a sign that you may have 
thinned out your gastric lining, have a gastric ulcer. And in those cases, one of the best things to take is deglycerized licorice, DGL. And DGL will help improve the lining of your gut lining. You can also take glutamine. Glutamine is an amino acid that, that can help, help support your intestinal cells to regenerate. Uh, and then if those aren't working, and you still have reflux and burning can't tolerate, you absolutely need to get tested for H. pylori infection. That's important. Because the H. pylori organism furrows into the lining of the stomach, suppresses these cells, parietal cells producing HCL, and they constantly damage and create injury to the stomach lining. So that's also another key thing. If you have reflux and can't take apple cider vinegar, can't take HCL, and you take things like DGL and glutamine, listen, it should, it should work within 30 days. And after 30 days, you still have symptoms, you definitely need to be tested for H. pylori. Okay, um, so can you please say again, you for how long you have to be off fats? So off fats, to, to give your gallbladder, think about it this way, you wanna give your gallbladder, if your gallbladder is not working well, you gotta give it a break. And you gotta let the bile, the bile thin out. So you have to go off fats, for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Say that again. 30. 30 days. Or 60, 60. 60 days or 90 days. Three zero six zero nine zero. Yeah. Okay. Or, sorry, no one can understand you. Sorry, I slurred my words. <laughs> Let me bring my mic closer. It's good. It's and good. and uh, and uh, uh, if you it, it, your biggest clue of how, if you need to go longer is you still can't digest fats well. So you might try for 30 days and then go to some kind of fatty meal you weren't able to tolerate before and see if you can tolerate it. And if you still can't tolerate it, you need to go longer. Okay, so now a few questions. Um, what is the best method to test for H. pylori? Can, and part of that is, what labs can you order to test H. pylori, ulcers, gastritis? Okay, so if you want to test for H. pylori infection because you're getting reflux and burning and you can't heal it, um, then you can do um, the gold standard test is what's called the urea breath test. All your conventional labs do it. You can also do what's called an H. pylori stool antigen test, and all your conventional labs do it. So, if you get either of those two tests done, it can be it can be very accurate. You can also check antibodies, but the problem with antibodies, so it's a blood test to check for H. pylori, is that they, the antibodies can stay high for up to two years. So it's not, it could be past exposure or past infection. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting rid of it. And if you do get rid of the H. pylori organism and you did a baseline antibody test, you'll see your antibodies get higher. So it looks like you're getting worse, but you're not getting worse. You just have your immune system more efficient fighting it. So the best tests are the breath test and stool antigen test, which can be done by any conventional medical lab. Okay, perfect. Your primary care provider can easily do that for you. Yeah. Okay, Nancy's asking, what causes low HCL in the first place? Right, so that was one of the things we talked about. What causes low HCL in the first place? So once you find out you have low HCL, you gotta go like, why do I have it? Right. So the most common cause for people 40 and older is just aging. Your actual parietal cell, your pancreatic reserves go down just like all different cellular function goes down as you get older. Um, people under 40, the most common cause is H. pylori. Mm -hmm. And then there's like a, also like a timeline. Once people get 65 and older, they keep getting reflux and, and H. pylori over and over again. They get this vicious cycle, so then it goes back to H. pylori. So H. pylori aging are the most common. Um, hypothyroidism has been shown to cause hypochlorhydria until the thyroid levels are maintained and TSH levels go back to normal. Um, you can still have hypochlorhydria. Any kind of chronic inflammatory issue like celiac disease or chronic gluten dairy sensitivity, anything that causes chronic gut inflammation can cause that. So sometimes you have to really follow a gluten dairy free diet if you know you're sensitive to those foods and then you'll see the hypochlorhydria go away. So those are the most common causes. So funny, people were asking about H, uh, Hashimoto's and um, gallbladder issues. Is that, are those two commonly linked together? Yeah, so they are. So the longer it longer took for someone that had Hashimoto's, so let's say if Hashimoto's, your thyroid gland got destroyed and your TSH levels went up and you, you were hypothyroid for 10 years mm -hmm. or five years before someone finally decided to run a thyroid test and see you, you, they may have hypothyroid. Being in a thyroid hormone deficiency state, but not having enough thyroid hormones because your gland's destroyed from Hashimoto's and can't produce it, does promote gallbladder sludge formation. So the longer it took for someone to diagnose you with hypothyroidism, the more likely you have another, I should say, you can add another risk factor to the, to the fact of getting gallstones. Um, and also not producing enough hydrochloric acid. 
So those are all key factors for both uh, hydrochloric acid issues and gallbladder issues. Okay, so then you were talking about deglycerized licorice yeah. a while ago. And so someone is asking, how long um, is it safe to take DGL-4 and does DGL raise blood pressure? Okay, so deglycerized licorice, DGL, mm -hmm. does not raise blood pressure. Does not. Does not. Right. Glycerize, glycerized licorice does. Right. So within licorice, there is a component called glyceriza, and glyceriza is the compound that increases blood pressure. So for people that have like really low blood pressure and they're trying to get the blood pressure, you want to actually use licorice root extract to really help them retain their... And what licorice root does is it helps retain sodium, causes sodium retention, and it gets blood pressure back up. Um, for people that don't want to impact their blood pressure, but just want to heal their gut, this is why manufacturers have always made DGL, deglycerized licorice. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the glycerized component to raise blood pressure. So that's, that's so the licorice itself has lots of flavonoids that help heal the lining of the gut and lots of antioxidants that are very effective in healing the stomach lining. But the glycerize activates uh, a hormone called 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which causes sodium retention. And that's why the, the, the DGL form is made. So you want to use DGL. What was the second part of that question, or is that it? How long is it oh, safe to use for? You can use it indefinitely. There's no problems using DGL. You should also know that if you take DGL, your stool color can change. Okay. Uh, especially if you take a lot uh, <laughs> to more of like a blackish, bluish color, which, which is a concern because, you, you know, people confuse that with rectal bleeding. And, and as long as there's no blood, and it's just, and if you get the, any change in your stool color, stop DGL if it goes away. It's most likely DGL. Add it back in. If it comes back, it's, and it's most likely DGL. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But DGL um, can be taken long term. It's basically licorice extract. It's a botanical. Um, and DGL itself can be taken long term, no problems. Um, what are the differences in symptoms of gallbladder sludge versus SIBO? So gallbladder sludge and SIBO have very characteristic symptom differences. They both have bloating distension. With SIBO, anything, any kind of sugar, any kind of any kind of starch, any kind of fiber, will cause bloating and distension. And gallbladder issues, it's very specific to just fats. Mm -hmm. So that's the key way you tell the difference. So if you just have some olive oil <laughs> and you get bloating and distension, that's not SIBO. That is gallbladder. If you have any kind of sugar or f fiber and you get, but there's no fat in it and you get distension, that's most likely SIBO. And in the, by the way, in the gut puzzle program, we go through all the ways to figure all the stuff out, and then we have diet plans for you and nutritional, nutraceutical recommendations and all that for you. That's, so, a, that's a common question yeah. I'm getting right now. Is, that's the key thing, too, is like, you know, these gut things, we do these talks to try to share information with people and get people to know about the program, but um, we, we realize even if we write a book or do anything, it's not going to really get people to figure out what they need to do for their gut. You really, you really need to go through a step-by-step -step thought process, understand the concepts of north to south, how to differentiate different types of conditions for different types of protocols. So you also you don't end up taking, you know, 100 supplements that you don't need that don't really work that can cause more mild digestion because <laughs> you can't handle them all. Um, but, uh, you know, there's specific symptoms for specific patterns. Yes. Okay, so Sean is asking, if one requires eight 650 milligram biotin HDL capsules to digest a moderate protein meal, is that something one should expect to do for the rest of their life? Or will and can stomach acid production eventually improve with better digestion like can you raise your stomach if you're taking yeah definite... so so if you if you can't if you have to take whatever like eight capsules of eight hydrochloric acid to digest your meals that's also a red flag so always always if you have chronic hcl they'd always get checked for h pylori yeah. and if you don't have h pylori um then that is what it is listen some people one of the another major cause why people have chronic hydrochloric acid issues is their gut degenerates people that have early parkinson's disease 10, 20 years before they even have a tremor are going to start to have mild digestion issues. So there's no rules. It's just the fact that you got to listen to your body, see what it responds to. But if you end up like you're 50 and you have to take hydrochloric acid, you might need to take it ongoing. And here's how you'll know. Your body will tell you. <laughs> it's not a theory. It's not anyone's like thought or philosophy. You just won't feel like you're digesting your protein. And you take some enzymes and you feel like you are. And you, know, you notice that if you forget your enzymes, you get severely bloated and distended, and then when you take them, you feel fine. So out, outside of any theories, you'll know if you need to take it once you understand how it works. Okay, so kind of a follow-up to that. 
is there any danger in taking digestive enzymes long term, like down the road regulation of one's own endogenous production of that enzyme? Yeah, so taking digestive enzymes are, are not going to cause any endogenous reflexive lack of production on your own. Uh, it's not how this works. You basically have a sensor that sees how much is in there and then produces and synthesizes them. Now, uh, if you've been taking enzymes for a while, uh, your feedback loop can become sluggish, but it doesn't mean your cells are going to also degenerate and you're not going to make them. It's not like a muscular cell. So you may um, not take enzymes for a while. On the first few meals you eat without enzymes, you may not feel so fine, and then you might go back within two or three days and not feel like you need enzymes at all if you just need it for a short period of time. So there's some adaptation if you've been taking enzymes for a long period of time to let your GI tract figure out how much to release, but there's no suppression and generation of your own endogenous production by taking enzymes. You just remember, different foods have different acidities all the, all the time. Mm -hmm. Like You're always uh, playing with different um, alkaline acid ratios um, just from the foods you eat. Okay. Um, sorry. Endogenous versus exogenous. Endo oh, endogenous means your own body's making it. Exogenous means you're taking it. Right. And, yes, thank you. Um, Okay, Kim, is a water-soluble vitamin D assimilated any better than non? All, vi all, vitamin, all vit vitamin D? As in the teeth, yeah. Water-soluble vitamin D? There's, that's impossible. I didn't think that was a thing. It's so. not possible. Okay. <laughs> vitamin D is fat. Fat, yes. right. You can't make it water-soluble unless you break it down. Right. So I don't, know, I don't understand the question, but no. Vitamin D requires you to have bile, however you take it. Okay. It's absorbent. I understand. I, I, and I know you answered this, but I need to okay. throw this out there again. Abby's asking, what if reflux is from carbs, not fat? So reflux from carbs yeah. um, can be two things. It can, first of all, the most common thing is that it's just a pancreatic enzyme deficiency. So that's one thing. But also carbs, if you have a lot of starch, that also impacts how much um, your HCL production too. So if you already have low stomach acid and load up on a lot of starch, you may end up some, with some reflux because your HCL is low. So you can still do the apple cider vinegar challenge. You can Next time you have a carb meal that would normally cause that, take a couple tablespoons of apple cider vinegar and see if it helps you. If it does, you may need some hydrochloric acid. If it doesn't help you, you then you may want to try some pancreatic enzymes. And you just might need to take some pancreatic digestive enzymes. When you go to the health food store, you might see the word digestive enzyme. you got to see what's actually on the product. Um, so things like uh, amylase, lipase, sucratase, anything you see with the ASC is, is pancreatic enzymes. And you see the word hydrochloric acid, that's different, that's stomach acid. So there's supplements at the health food store that have HCL, which is just stomach acid enzymes. There's pancreatic enzymes, um, and they just may use the word digestive enzyme. If they use the word digestive enzymes, look at the label, see what they are. Uh, it may be a combination of both HCL and pancreatic enzymes, or it just may be pancreatic enzymes. So, yeah, it's okay. things you should know about. And um, Kim meant vitamin A. Vitamin A. Instead of vitamin D. Listen, all, all, all vitamins uh, are fat-soluble. Uh, if someone's telling you it's water-soluble, stay away. <laughs> okay, <laughs> really quickly. Susan's trying to explain this a little bit, um, but maybe you can help. Your reference to water slash fat soluble isn't about how it's delivered to the body, but how the body metabolizes it. Some people are saying, well, I get a dried vitamin D, and so that's different, right? Yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand the question. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip it. I, I just, listen, all vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K are all fat soluble. I don't care if it's dried. I don't care if it's liquid. I don't care if it's emulsified. It's all fat soluble. No matter how you take it, even if it's emulsified, like emulsified is the most common way people help absorb. Um, you still have to have bile break down the fat particle so it can be absorbable. So it's easier for emulsified, maybe this is what they're referring to, maybe easier for emulsified vitamin A, emulsified vitamin E or D to get absorbed. You'll see that all the time in nutritional manufacturers. But as far as absorbing it uh, into essential nutrients, you still have to have bile break down that fat structure to an absorbable subunit, especially for the nutrient. So anyways.
Okay, so Leah's saying, what about pepsin that is usually with HCL? Is that okay to take? Yeah, pepsin and HCL are fine. You can take both of them together. So manufacturers will use pepsin with HCL, but really the key key um, supplement ingredient you're looking for is HCL. Okay, um, Monica, what about acid reflux in children? Acid reflux in children is almost always H. pylori. Almost always H. pylori. You got to get tested for H. pylori. And I got to tell you, H. pylori can pass from family member to family member. Mm -hmm. um, so be aware of that. And you may have one child that has symptomatic H. pylori, and the and the mom doesn't have any symptoms at all. <laughs> they get the child treated for H. pylori with heavy antibiotics and the conventional approach, and then it comes back, and it keeps coming back because family members also have H. pylori. So. Uh, you, you may need to test other family members, parents, <laughs> if you have a child with H. pylori and make sure everyone is treated at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you give any tips on managing silent reflux? Silent reflux. I don't know what they're doing. I'm not sure what silent reflux means. Okay. I would assume it may mean like they don't have heartburn, but they have heart symptoms. They feel like they're having a heart attack. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Some okay, sorry. Just, yeah. Um, what about passing gas? No bloating. Is passing gas normal? Like you're saying, if you're belching or burping, that's not normal. How about gas when? Well, gas is, gas is just fermentation. So if you have a change in your diet and all of a sudden you eat a lot of fiber, right. um, maybe maybe you have maybe you're not used to eating lots of beans and you have a lot of fiber, you're gonna get some. You're gonna have some increased fermentation. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have some gas. So gas um, is but after not every meal. Yeah. So gas, when you have a change in your diet, especially your fiber intake, is going to be normal. But having gas after every meal, no matter what, is just something's some, something's wrong. You really need to check that out. You need to figure out what's going on. But uh, so everyone's gonna have occasional gas and bloating, especially with an increase in intake of fiber or a change in meal. People are giving ex ex examples of what silent reflux is. Is oh. it GERD? Is it? Is it LPR? Yeah. I don't. I don't know. It's hard to. Understand. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone. That, you know, when I sign in, some people say hi. Thank you. I don't want to distract, but thank you for saying that. It really does. It's really nice to see people log in. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. Um, and by the way, don't forget to to, to join our uh, our Facebook page, and uh, and then you'll be notified whenever we have these talks. Perfect. Um, what about coffee enemas to help with bile sludge? Oh, coffee enemas. Okay, so yeah, coffee enemas. Um, you know, coffee enemas get people overreact with coffee enemas. I don't know why for some reason. It's just what do you mean overreact? Meaning, oh my God, you you can't be trusted because you're talking about coffee enemas in the healthcare <laughs> okay. field. I've had that happen to me on some Amazon reviews. <laughs> I think, uh, but it's 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 a way you can definitely cause a change in your bowel. <laughs> yeah. So the thing with coffee is uh, coffee enemas can be very effective for helping with gallbladder sludge um, because caffeine uh, activates um, nicotinic receptors. These are called acetylcholine nicotinic receptors, just smooth muscles receptors of the gallbladder and of the small intestine. And that's how it causes people to have an urgency to have a bowel movement. Now, there was a study that was published that looked at the effect of gallbladder contraction between a coffee enema and oral caffeine intake. And even though it was slightly better with a coffee enema, just drinking coffee seemed to have a significant impact, very close to a coffee enema. So it seems like as far as gallbladder contraction is concerned, because you want, so if you have gallbladder sludge, if your gallbladder is not contracting, you can't break down that sludge, right? Just like think of it as like, um, you, you make a protein shake or something and it's all kind of sludge in the bottom. You have to shake it to, 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 to get it to thin out. So the gallbladder has to contract just like you're shaking a container with the protein powder in it to move. So, and this is why sedentary lifestyle, lack of activity really cause gallbladder sludge because every time you activate and exercise, you change your autonomics and you get some contraction and movement. What coffee does is coffee causes those smooth muscles of the gallbladder to contract so you can kind of break, break, break away some of that sludge. So uh, coffee enema is slightly more effective, but even just drinking caffeine can be effective. And again, the caffeine activates smooth muscle receptors that cause the gallbladder to contract. Okay, Jan is asking, can you have low stomach acid and sludgy bile without reflux? Yes, it's very, very common. You could have no reflux symptoms at all. 
Yeah. And you just have low HCL, so every time you eat protein or fat, you get dis- you get some distended and bloating, but no reflux. You feel like you have a brick in your stomach, and then you eat fat, and you have it. It's very, very common to have both without any reflux symptoms. Most people that have low hydrochloric acid do not have reflux symptoms. Okay. Um, does coffee not block phase one of liver detox, though? No, coffee does not want block phase one of liver detox. Coffee actually provides flavonoids and nutrients that are used in phase one oxidation reduction pathways. Um, anything that provides antioxidants does not block phase one. Okay. Okay. Um, bum, bum, bum. People are really so happy with this talk. Thank oh, you so great. much. Thank you. It's a lot of... Um... See, there's a confusion out there with like what to do for your gallbladder and then like SIBO gets really really popular everyone thinks they have SIBO right. then everyone thinks they have mast cell activation syndrome and then gluten sensitivity was like really popular for a while and people like you know then everyone thought they had celiac disease people don't understand between gluten and celiac disease um lots of people and then everyone you know everything that was wrong with someone's health was related to leaky gut and people don't understand that they have less research microbiome this is this is why we actually had to create a synchronized <laughs> Right. online program with multiple videos and a step-by-step process because um, people were getting it. And I could p- tell you, as a person who's taught healthcare practitioners for many years, a lot of healthcare practitioners don't get it. Right. So by the time you get, like a person, even finding a healthcare practitioner that can get it and they can walk a person through it, your chances of finding something like that are very slim. Then if you read everything that's out there, there's a problem. So this is this is why we think there's definitely a need um, for the online program like the Gut Puzzle, which we're promoting with all these different talks. So... Again, uh, check that out. Okay, so you kind of went through this a little bit, but yeah. maybe it's more to say it again. Um, Christy is saying, so how does low stomach acid cause reflux? If it's stomach acid, is right. low, how? So if you don't have enough stomach acid, um, there's a couple things that happen. First of all, um, if you can't digest proteins very well, um, you can get some pu- protein putrefaction that can change the microenvironment to be actually more acidic than, than not. But really what happens is when you don't have like a regular state of hydrochloric acid production than just proteins, you start to have imbalance of how you surge out HCL Mm -hmm. and you can get this really abnormal huge surge of hydrochloric acid because you don't have any baseline hydrochloric acid and then you get that immediate reflux symptoms. If your body has some degree of normal hydrochloric acid production, you never have these huge abnormal surges after you eat protein. Um, and, And this is why um, it's kind of strange for people that when they have reflux mm-hmm. and burning, when they take something like apple cider vinegar or even hydrochloric acid, all of a sudden all the burning goes away by taking more acid. But that is absolutely what happens with the majority of people. They're and usually the one, give, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. They're usually given something to suppress the yes. burning they feel. Yeah, and they're like in shock because they're t- told to take an alkaline anti-acid. Right. And, and then they end up taking something more acidic, and they're like, wow, that actually did work. Right. But remember, for people that have ulcers, they will have irritation from that and that's a that that means you have to heal the lining of the stomach okay gotcha so then stephanie's asking is there any test to determine hcl levels and are they individualized for right. everybody right so there is the gold standard test to measure hydrochloric acid levels it's called the gastric heisenberg test and this test involves a person swallowing a capsule with a string on it this is actually how it's done you swallow a capsule with a string on it and by the way they use the same capsule with everyone they don't like no change. they don't yeah they do they they clean it so no, can't they can't keep them away. These capsules are ex- these capsules are expensive, by the way. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> and then you swallow this capsule, and then you uh, take an alkalizing drink, and then they time how. And then once the capsule's in your stomach, it'll get an accuracy of the pH of your stomach. So there's some clues right away what's going on with your stomach. But then they you, you take a predetermined alkaline solution, and then alkalize your stomach, and then they measure how long it takes for your stomach to become acidic enough. Again, and. That's the laboratory way of, of testing it. Now, no one does that test anymore. There's a few um, few gastroenterologists that still do the test. Um, there's some naturopaths that um, in their office do that kind of testing still, but it's not a commonly utilized test. So it, if you really need a quantitative measurement, you gotta find someone that does a gastric Heilenberg P, uh, acidity test. Uh, outside of that, sometimes your biggest clue is just how you respond to food and supplements like we talked about. Okay, a couple more. So Don is asking, then how do you know if you're taking too much HCL? You know, the thing is that the stomach and your gut have very good feedback loops when it's working well to manage it. So if you 
if you take too much HCL, and, and it's, I mean, for most people, they, they, it w they won't even notice anything if their stomach lining is healthy. Um, there could be a point you get a little bit of irritation, a little bit of reflux if you take way too much. Like you take, instead of taking two caps of HCL, you take 10. And by the way, the way you would notice like how much HCL you need mm -hmm. is you start with like one capsule, and then the next time you eat them and see how you feel with your bloating and extension. And then if that's okay, then you add another cap. And then if you feel like that maybe wasn't as ideal, you add another capsule and you kind of work your way up. And let's take it to three capsules and then you feel like no bloating digestion. There's no point for you to take more. <laughs> but if you end up taking like 10 for some reason because you just want to see what happened, you may get a little reflux and burning for a few minutes, but it's not going to be long and then it goes away. So you just want to stick to the dose that really um, gets rid of your bloating and distension. There's no reason to go past that. Okay, hold on, two more. Um, will the gut class address if you don't have a gallbladder? Sorry, this is a... Yeah, so in, okay. in the in the gut health puzzle program we have at Dr. K News, drknews.com, we, we go through gallbladder step by step, we go through HCL step by step, we go through everything step by step with information, booklets, workbooks to help you go through the process. So, um, yeah, it's, it's intended for us to help you identify what's going on and then give you the strategies to help resolve it. Okay, two more. Two more questions. Um, oh, crud. Is there or when is the best time to take HCL with a meal? Right. So the question, this is a really common question people ask by HCL or digestive enzymes. Like when you take it. So you can take it right before you eat. Like let's say the first two to five minutes before you eat. You can take it with your meal. As you're eating your food, you take some. Or you can take it right after, within the first two to five minutes. You can go longer, but that's those are the ideal scenarios. Any one of those scenarios will work, help digest your food. You may want to experiment to see what you like best. Some people feel better when they take it directly with their meal. Some people feel better after they eat. Um, whatever you do is still going to work if you follow those guidelines. But, but there is a personal preference to it that you may want to experiment with for yourself. I'm sorry, I lied. There are still to do questions. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, this is a kind of common one. Um, do you treat H. pylori before SIBO? Or can you treat them at the same time? You can absolutely treat them at the same time. Okay. Basically, with the SIBO issue, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to go on a FODMAP diet to get rid of that change in your gut environment. Say that slowly. FOD. Oh, F FODMAP diet is a diet people use for SIBO. Yeah. And uh, F O D M A P it stands for fructose sides, fruct fructose oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and um, Basically, you remove all sugars and fibers and follow this FODMAP diet. And that's to change the environment. You can absolutely do that in conjunction with supporting the gallbladder or treating H. pylori or whatever you need to at the same time. Okay. Can decaf coffee work the same for gallstones? As opposed to can caffeine? decaf coffee work the same way? Decaf coffee still has about 60% caffeine in it and can still help the gallbladder function too. So if you drink decaf, now I would encourage you not to drink decaf because to decaffeinate coffee, use a lot of chemicals that yeah. you don't want in your body. Why would you it would be that? better for you to just <laughs> dilute your coffee yeah. from natural coffee beans instead of taking decaffeinated decaf. Decaf is not non-caffeinated. I mean, just find a way to figure out how you can dilute your coffee. Maybe get an Americano and, and only have one shot and have lots of water in it or something like that. But you, you, I would just encourage you, if you're going to drink coffee, don't drink decaffeinated um, there's too many chemicals involved. <laughs> sorry, we just like coffee a lot here. Okay, sorry, last question. Okay, p p someone that people are asking, if my stomach got much worse after I tried the apple cider vinegar, how do I calm it down? What? Right, so if your stomach gets a lot worse after you do the apple cider vinegar, yeah. um, you, you could technically take an anti-acid to help symptoms right away. But that's not the best thing. You can still just take DG DGL. You can just take deglycerized licorice if you have it. If you don't have it, you're going to be burning for a few hours. Um, that's just the way it is. But DGL will work right away uh, as, as a as a as a helpful 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 way to do it. So maybe if you're going to try the apple cider vinegar, have a little. Thing if you suspect you may have an ulcer, huh. you may want to have some DGL ahead of time. Yeah. And DGL is just good for you to take to help your gastric lining. It has lots of antioxidants, so it's not like it's something that will hurt you if you take it. Anyways, um, right, Dr. thank you so much for uh, joining us for today's talk. Please check out the gut um, puzzle program, uh, gut health, uh, figuring out the puzzle at Dr. K News, drknews com, And please follow us on Facebook, and we'll see you guys for the next talk. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.